Can you hear me? Not working. Chag Shalom Shalosh. Is it working? It is. <coughs> it's my voice. Rabbi Daniel Friedman was elected the spiritual leader of Congregation Bet O in Deerfield, Illinois, in 1965. I was four. Previously, he was assistant rabbi at KAM Temple in Chicago for three years. Rabbi Friedman received his bachelor's degree from Brandeis University and both his bachelor's and master's degree in Hebrew letters at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institution of Religion. He was ordained in 1962. His special interests include That's the philosophy. That's when you were born? That's when she was born. That's when you were born. Oh. When you were <laughs> I'm going to tell you how old she was, and every, every marker of your career will know how old Ruth was. His special interests include the philosophy of religion and the study of ethics. He's founding member of the Society for Humanistic Judaism, a member of the editorial board of the magazine Humanistic Judaism. He's also a frequent contributor. Did anyone lose this? That's a little, little box? It's a pill box. A wooden, no, pill, a wooden box. pill box. With lavender. I'll pay $20. It's really not fair for me to have to follow Ruth. I've never felt so old as I do right now. <laughs> But we are dealing with spirituality which pays no attention to age or to matter in general. Some of the men present, some of the men present, can you now hear? One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, now? Okay. Some of the men present may at one time or another have picked up a copy of Playboy magazine, not to look at the pictures, but to read its very fine articles. My favorite magazine is The New Yorker, not to read the articles, <laughs> but to look at the pictures, or as I call them, the cartoons, and believe it or not, the current, this week's issue of The New Yorker contains a uh, cartoon which shows a woman at a cocktail party addressing a man dressed in clerical garb with a clerical collar, asking him this question, do you think of yourself as a spiritual person? <laughs> I wish to begin with a question of you all. Do you consider yourself a spiritual person? <laughs> In fact, whatever you mean by spiritual, and we've had some definitions, some indications already this weekend, but whatever you mean by spiritual, would you please raise your hand if you consider yourself a spiritual person? Keep, keep your hand up, please. <laughs> Just keep them up for a second. No, I I'm not good enough. To I think you think it implies a good person. All right, thank you. The rest of you may leave. The rest of you can leave. But let me give some of you the benefit of the doubt. You may not know what I meant when I asked the question. You may not know what my definition of spiritual is, so how could you possibly answer the question? For example, does spiritual imply a belief in a deity? And if so, a personal God? 
Suppose you are an atheist, as I am. Can we consider ourselves spiritual persons? That was a rhetorical question. All the questions I asked from now on are rhetorical questions. For me, in order to continue my discussion of the topic that was assigned to me, art and nature, beauty and spirituality, I have to suggest two basically different, quite different types of spirituality. The first is what I shall call, and has been already referred to by other members of the panel, as mystical spirituality. Mystical spirituality presumes that there is a non-human consciousness or power or being out there and it need not be called God with whom or which human beings can communicate or connect. And it need not be called God. In fact, many so-called New Age, quote, mystics, may not call that being or power or force God, and yet it is a being with whom or which they or her, they do feel that they can connect. When they do, they feel that they are in touch with the ultimate source of meaning the ultimate source of value and of life itself. To be connected with this higher power is to feel at one with the universe, with nature, and in harmony with all that is, all that is. According to this understanding of spirituality, a spiritual person is relatively unconcerned with the material world and its immediate mundane concerns, for he or she is focused instead upon that which transcends the material world, the physical world, and hence the word spiritual. And therefore, one is concerned with what is of ultimate indeed eternal significance. This to me is the simplest, perhaps the too, a too simple, but the simplest way of describing what I would call mystical spirituality. In contrast to mystical spirituality, natural spirituality does not recognize the existence of a mystical or supernatural realm or deity, yet acknowledges that we human beings are more than our physical selves. We cannot be entirely understood in terms of the chemical processes and electrical charges and synapses that can be described we cannot be reduced entirely to our physical features. After the most complete physical description of me or you, something remains, something remains. My personality, my will, my self, my soul if you like, that is a function of my body, and this is important, whatever it is that remains is a function of my body, more specifically of my brain, but it is not identical with or reducible to it. That is, if my brain is removed, myself, my personality, my soul is gone. And yet, a full analysis of my brain does not 
fully reveal myself, my soul, my will. Nor are we entirely programmed by heredity or by environment. We have undetermined hopes, dreams, feelings, worries that are not entirely the result of influences upon us from past or present experience. I'm not suggesting that we are totally undetermined. Obviously, there are profound influences upon us by virtue of our biography, by virtue of the time and place that we happen to occupy, and so on. But we do make decisions and behave in ways that are unpredictable. This is what it means to be human. We are free, as no other living things are, to think, to choose, and to act on the basis of conscious decision. Not only are we conscious, we are self-conscious. This particular kind of awareness is unique among living things. It is this freedom and this distinctive kind of consciousness, self-awareness, that make each human being unique to a degree not possible among other living things. It is this freedom and this consciousness that entitle us and compel us to hold human beings responsible for their behavior. We do not hold unfree or unconscious human beings responsible for their behavior. We assume freedom and consciousness on the part of human beings that we do hold responsible. And yet, notwithstanding the significance of this peculiarly human nature of ours, we understand very little about it, about the nature and source of consciousness in particular. We know where it resides, but we do not truly understand it. As of this date, to my knowledge, science has not identified in strictly material terms what makes me and my consciousness different from you and yours. And why? One day, perhaps, the self or essence or soul of a person will be understood completely, although I doubt it. And to my knowledge, there is no evidence yet available that would indicate that we ever will completely understand what makes me and my consciousness different from you and yours. And therefore, I doubt that we will ever achieve complete knowledge of what makes us tick in the sense that we have such knowledge of what makes birds and squirrels and trees tick. And therefore, unless and until then, we may rationally believe that there is something that we call the human spirit that is quite real. Indeed, is the essence of who we are, yet is beyond scientific understanding and analysis. By the human spirit, I mean that which is left after my material being has been described and analyzed as completely as we possibly can do. So, namely, what is left is what I call my will, my unpredictable decision-making capacity 
the features of my consciousness that make me uniquely what I am. In other words, the most important thing about me or you is what I call the human spirit. Natural spirituality affirms the reality of the human spirit and locates it entirely within us, within our natural bodies, more specifically within our brains, or I prefer to say within our minds, because brain suggests raw matter and natural spirituality affirms that we are more than mere material. By mind, I mean the brain and all of the results of its use, including the choices and decisions we have made over a lifetime, the values we have developed, the experiences we have enjoyed and suffered and interpreted, and interpreted is a key word, it is not just what has happened to me or you, but what we make out of what has happened to me or you, that is essential to what I mean by the human spirit in us. When people connect, as I hope we are doing right now, their minds are at work. Their minds are at work. <clears throat> they use their minds to communicate and to receive messages from one another. Whether one is an artist or a teacher or a writer or a musician or a rabbi or a salesperson, reaching another human being via reason and emotions, both, is what I mean by our spiritual connection. And we do so by means of the natural languages that are unique to human beings. I refer not only to speech, which may be our most distinctive characteristic, but I refer also to the other languages that we have available to us, the ability to write, to sing, to dance, to paint, to sculpt, all are uniquely human communication vehicles or languages and are included in and are necessary to the life of the spirit. It is clear that our spiritual connection is, as one of my previous panelists mentioned yesterday, I believe, horizontal, not vertical. Meaning, rather than relating to a higher power up there or out there, above and beyond humanity, our spiritual life consists of relating to other human beings and to reality in general by means of our consciousness and nothing else. That is entirely our method of relating and communicating via consciousness. Inasmuch as reference to a non-human disembodied consciousness in no way adds to an understanding of ourselves or our experience, we are entitled to consider ourselves spiritual beings in a completely and purely natural sense. All of our values, ethical or aesthetic, therefore, must be viewed as purely human creations. They do not exist apart from us or outside of us. We invent them, all of our values, we invent them in order to enrich our existence, to invest it with meaning and purpose. Our lives have no meaning or purpose outside of our minds. All values, whether aesthetic or ethical, reside only in our minds. 
We create them and we impose them upon reality. We decide that justice is good. And sunsets are beautiful. That honesty is virtuous and Mozart is lovely. Beauty and goodness exist only and literally in the mind of the beholder and derive entirely from human experience. Values have no referent outside of ourselves. Unless, of course, a mind other than ours created them. This is the theistic premise. Namely, that values derive from a reality, a non-human source of truth and beauty outside of the human mind. The theistic premise asserts that natural beauty and moral beauty are objectively beautiful because they are divinely authored and sanctioned. We are to be obedient to them if we are to earn both divine and human approval. To betray a divine commandment is to sin. To fail to appreciate the grandeur of a natural wonder is to be guilty of ingratitude. Theistic ethics and aesthetics are mutually reinforcing. The thou shalt nots are not only moral truths, they are beautiful as well. Truth and beauty overlap. The lush meadow and the vast sea are more than beautiful. They are good. They are, after all, God's apostrophe S, God's creation. To soil them is to commit a moral infraction. Nothing belongs to human beings, not even their own bodies. One may not destroy one's self or anything within one's body, for the body is God's property. Returning to our consideration of beauty from a naturalistic understanding of spirituality, objectively, beauty does not exist in nature. It is entirely a human construct. A butterfly is no more beautiful than a bug, a rose than a weed, the ocean than a mud puddle. Nature just is. It is neither beautiful nor ugly. We endow natural objects and phenomena with evaluative significance. We find grandeur in the Grand Canyon, serenity in a pastoral landscape. We find a weed-infested ditch ordinary and a pile of rubbish ugly. We perceive by means of our senses, colors, shapes, sounds, that we decide constitute beauty. Certain phenomena, such as rainbows, or diamonds, or Nicole Kidman's, <laughs> are more rare than others. Sometimes that is our criterion for beauty. Certain objects, such as forests and lakes, are more useful to us than others. Sometimes usefulness is our criterion for beauty. Certain sights, such as the sky and mountains, are vastly larger than we. Sometimes vastness is a criterion for beauty. Obviously, notions of beauty may be specific to a given culture or time or place. What a, communi a community of African tribesmen consider beautiful may not correspond to what a Detroit cab driver considers beautiful. Whatever the criteria, whatever, that are implicitly or explicitly the basis of our declaring this beautiful and that not, 
It is clear that we human beings impose such value judgments upon nature. We decide, not nature, what is beautiful. Outside of our minds, a rainbow <coughs> is no more beautiful than a pile of dirt. A sunrise, a flower, a mountain is beautiful only to human beings. And only because human beings have determined that such things are beautiful. Again, beauty, beauty exists only in the eyes of the beholder. The feelings that beauty evoke, evokes in us, serenity, wonder, appreciation, elation, come entirely from within us. We feel as we do in the presence of such natural phenomena as waterfalls and deserts because of our perceptions, values, experiences, talents, knowledge, education, intelligence, rather than because of an inherent quality in the object to which we are responsible. Similarly, such values as justice, honesty, freedom, love, do not exist out there independently of human existence. All values come from within us. And therefore, given the infinite range of influences of, on us and differences among us, we do not necessarily agree do we, with one another, with respect to our values, ethical or aesthetic. Different values reflect the differences among human cultures and personalities and the historical contexts out of which values emerge. This is not to suggest, however, that all values are relative that all judgments are merely matters of personal taste, or that it is impossible to distinguish between better, quotes, values, ethical or aesthetic, from lesser or inferior values. One may legitimately conclude, for example, that a Mozart symphony is aesthetically better than a song by In Sync. You do know who In Sync no. is. <laughs> who, who's this Mozart character? How about you too? Madonna? Bob Dylan? Notwithstanding the greater popularity of the latter over the former, it is possible to legitimately conclude, rationally conclude, that a Rembrandt drawing is better art than my scribbling. Because of a principle of judgment or evaluation that can be applied to all human endeavors, Whichever human endeavor utilizes or exhibits the most distinctively human qualities and abilities, and to a greater degree, is better aesthetically than what does not. Whatever human endeavor utilizes or exhibits the most distinctively human qualities and abilities, and to a greater degree, is better aesthetically than what does not. Mozart is better music because it required more of the distinctively human attributes such as reason, imagination, intelligence, self-discipline, not to mention training, education, and sheer talent to create. And because it is more demanding in that it calls upon the most distinctively human attributes, intellectual, emotional, and yes, spiritual, upon both the performer or the composer and the listener than is elevator music. It is also more rewarding 
Mozart, that is, than elevator music. For the same reason, that is, it requires the cultivation of the highest human attributes in order to express, understand, and appreciate the music. By highest, I mean, again, the most uniquely human attributes. I keep pointing to my brain, my mind, as distinguished from those merely physical attributes that we share with other animals. I have in mind such abilities as thinking, feeling, remembering, dreaming, hoping, judging, none of which are possible, as far as we know, to any species other than ours. Animals, so far as we know, lack these abilities. They may feel pain and pleasure and act so as to avoid one and seek the other, but they are unable to reflect on their behavior. They do not decide to postpone immediate gratification for the sake of more significant long-term goals. They lack the ability to conceptualize, to formulate opinions and judgments, to distinguish between right and wrong. Animals behave on the basis of instinct. We act on the basis of choice. We are the only living things capable of morality and of art. It is ridiculous to say that that squirrel is evil or that that alligator is evil. They are merely behaving as nature has programmed them to behave. They either survive or they do not, but their behavior is not morally <coughs> significant. Ours is. I hasten to add that human physical attributes, which as such have no special spiritual significance, physical attributes, that is, may be developed to the point of artistry and thus to spiritual significance. Every musician, dancer, painter, and sculptor does so by training muscles to perform according to highly exacting, complex, and subtle requirements. Every athlete does so by honing ordinary physical skills and strength to the point of artistic expression. A tennis player, a fullback, a shortstop may exhibit such grace, power, and judgment that can only be evaluated by, as beautiful by those who truly understand and appreciate the very human self-discipline, training, and talent that make athletic accomplishment thrilling to behold. So I am not restricting spiritual significance only to aesthetic or so-called aesthetic achievement. Any human endeavor that utilizes human attributes to the point of artistic expression, including athletics, is spiritually meaningful. Inasmuch as the attributes I have mentioned are those which enable us to improve civilization, that is, to improve the quality of our lives from day to day and generation to generation, I believe it is legitimate to say that human attributes are higher than those of other animals. Higher. I believe it's, it is legitimate to say that human attributes constitute a higher level of being than do the attributes of other animals, inasmuch as they are the basis of civilization, of agriculture, science, technology, art, of all the creations of which human beings are capable. Raw physical power is not our most distinctive, phys uh, our most distinctive characteristic, nor could we survive on the basis of it alone. Other animals are superior to us in strength, speed, agility. We cannot fly. 
but our use of reason has enabled us to reach the moon. Reaching the moon, or building a skyscraper, or planting a field of wheat, or writing a symphony, is better than building a nest or gathering berries, insofar as it is an achievement and requires skills more essential to the satisfaction of human needs. And human need is the standard of what is good, because we are the only living beings for whom good is meaningful. Other living things either survive or not. We are capable not only of survival, that is, if we utilize our most distinctively human attributes, but of making human life more satisfying and pleasurable and less difficult and onerous. I've used many judgmental or value terms such as satisfying and less difficult. Who decides and on what criteria on such evaluations? Who decides what constitutes an improvement in the quality of our lives? We do. Each and every one of us does for him or herself. This does not imply that such judgments are not without objective significance. The differences between, say, Gandhi and Hitler can be submitted to objective analysis. I can legitimately conclude that one is a better person morally than the other. If one man decides that killing Jews improves the lives of the rest of the nation, he does not thereby have the right to murder those human beings. No one has this right. Because natural spirituality, lacking belief in external authority, who issues commands and determines values and sets standards, <coughs> lacking that kind of authority, natural spirituality requires respect for the human spirit in every person. Without an objectively verifiable source of truth outside of ourselves, we have no alternative but to live and let live. Which means pursue your own happiness, but always allow others to pursue theirs. It may be objected that natural spirituality diminishes the importance of values, aesthetic and moral, inasmuch as they are merely human values, <clears throat> merely. How much more significant would they be if they were underwritten by supernatural authority? And this, incidentally, if this isn't self-evident, is why atheists are suspect by the general population. It appears to people that atheists have no moral grounding, no moral discipline. And secular humanism is a kind of <coughs> guilt by association word, term. How much more important would values be if they are guaranteed by a supernatural authority than merely by human preference? On the contrary, natural spirituality may inspire us to appreciate beauty as well as justice, honesty, love, and so on, all the more precisely because we are aware that human beings are entirely, entirely responsible for creating and promoting the values as well as the conditions that make them possible. Absent the belief in a creator God, we may be more appreciative of a neighbor's garden because we are aware of the human intelligence and creativity, not to mention labor, that transformed randomly scattered seeds into an intelligently designed place of beauty. You know that old story about the visitor who is admiring his friend's garden and says, you and God have done a wonderful job here. 
To which his friend replies, you should have seen it when God had it to himself. <laughs> Whatever we behold in the natural world of flowers, mountains, and oceans, and in the human world of buildings, poetry, and morality, we who locate spirituality entirely within the human mind may be all the more appreciative of that mind's power. We are all the less likely to dismiss it, to condemn it, to mistrust it, aware that beauty enriches our lives, evokes the most powerful emotions, and inspires the noblest possibilities within us. We naturally wish to cultivate beauty and the appreciation of beauty in ourselves, in our families, in our community. Returning now to the question with which we began, I shall this time answer it myself. <laughs> are you a spiritual person? Of course you are. <laughs> Unless you have no use for music, literature, poetry, drama, or da dance, unless you are oblivious to the genius of Shakespeare and Chopin and the talent of Michael Jordan, unless you are indifferent to the majesty of a mountain range or the spectacle of a starry sky. It is clear that your spirituality derives entirely from within you, and it is clear that it is you who imposes your values upon all of reality. That is your greatness. <laughs> <laughs>